You're watching News Round, a recap of stories that made the headlines uh, during the week. I'm Ladi Williams. First off, let's have the headlines. Borno State Governor raises alarm over the growth of Islamic State of West Africa province and asks the federal government to check expansion of terror group in the country. And the federal government identifies 96 terrorism financiers in the country, says 45 of the suspects are to face prosecution. National Assembly to transmit constitution amendment bill to states by the end of February. President of Guinea-Bissau says he survived a coup attempt in under heavy gunfire for five hours. And that's news round in view, but we we'll begin now with security caution from the governor of Borno State, Professor Babagana Zulum regarding the threat currently posed by the Islamic State of West Africa province, ISWAP. Uh, Governor Zulm is urging the federal government not to allow the terror group to develop as they are more educated and destructive. Do take a listen. It is the 28th session of the presidential ministerial briefing and the critical subject of insecurity is again central. <laughs> The governor of Borno State, Professor Babagana Zulum, begins by reeling broad interventions, both locally and internationally, in the conflict reading northeast. But in spite of this, what is of utmost concern is the growing base of the Islamic State in West Africa province, Eswap, in some parts of Borno, which is home to about two million internally displaced persons. We shouldn't allow Eswap to grow. Eswap are more sophisticated, they are well pondered, they are, better, they are more educated. The Nigerian army has to re-strategize and defeat Iswap. Iswap will be a threat to the entire nation. Against this premise, Governor Zulum is asking the federal government to consider engaging foreign mercenaries. There is a need for the government of Nigeria to look, to rethink and look into the possibility of hiring mercenaries. I said it time without numbers. There's nothing wrong. America, Britain, many more countries that are stronger than Nigeria do use to, uh, you know, seek support outside. Clearly, the governor's request is at variance with the federal government's position in March 2021, ruling out engaging mercenaries to assist Nigeria in the fight against insurgency, conveyed through the National Security Advisor at the State House. And there are so many issues. When you come to the issue of mercenaries, it has to do with the issue of national pride also. I know you say, can pride be more of a concern than our security? We have the resources is just misapplication or underutilization that has affected our ability to deal with these people. Mr. President can say something, depending upon the situation at that particular time. He may change his mind. Governor Zulum also debunks earlier reports that two local government areas in the state are under the control of Boko Haram, clarifying that they are instead unoccupied by human population as the capacity to protect the people is lacking. Apparently, the governor is determined more than ever before to return those displaced persons back to the two local government areas that now stand empty in collaboration with the military. He's also confident that the Presidential Committee on Repatriation and Resettlement will help forge a sustainable path towards a self-reliant Borno state in the next 10 years. From the Presidential Villa, Gloria Umezeke, Channels Television News. And still with security um, matters, the analysis by the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit uh, for 2020 to 2021 has revealed that 96 financiers of terrorism in Nigeria have been identified, 
coupled with 424 associates, 123 companies, and 33 BDC businesses, all involved in terrorism funding in the country. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, mentioned this at the first briefing of the Ministry for 2022 on the fight against corruption in Abuja. Do take a listen. It is the first meeting the Minister of Information and Culture, Lahaji Lai Mohammed, is having with the media in 2022. And the focus is on the Buhari administration's war on corruption. I said the fight against corruption. This briefing is holding about a week after the Transparency International released its latest corruption perception index, where Nigeria dropped five places to 154 out of 180 countries. However, Alahaji Mohammed is quick to state that the briefing is not in a response to that report. I'm not really impressed or moved by what TI says. I'm more concerned about what we're doing. The minister links corruption with the war on terror, stating that a progress report from the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit reveals 96 financiers of terrorism in Nigeria. 96 financiers of terrorism in Nigeria. 424 associate supporters of the financiers. The involvement of 123 companies and 33 bureau chiefs. The analysis has resulted in the arrest of 45 suspects who will soon face prosecution and seizure of assets. The minister accuses naysayers of continuing to dismiss the Buhari administration's anti-corruption efforts. He reels out the achievements of the various agencies fighting corruption in the country in both the public and private sector. In 2021 alone, the FCC secured a total of 2,220 convictions. The TSC system has now been implemented in more than 90% of all federal MDs. The exact order in 2020 that gave financial autonomy to local governments, to state legislatures, to judiciary, some of the most effective ways of fighting corruption. The Minister of Information and Culture is stating categorically that today's briefing has nothing to do with the Transparency International report. However, this particular report by Transparency International identifies particular areas where corruption is rife, especially in the public service, where public servants have been accused of taking kickbacks for doing their job. Well, the Minister of Information and Culture believes that it is possible for us to check these particular excesses if everybody puts their hands on deck and follows the Buhari administration in its fight against corruption. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. And now to the National Assembly, where lawmakers in the upper chamber have again expressed their frustration over the issue of insecurity. They're asking the federal government to urgently send fighter jets to flush out those behind the kidnappings and killings of Nigerians, particularly in the Northeast. The Senate made this request while considering a point of order on the urgent need for drastic actions to bring an end to the act of banditry and kidnapping in Fuscari local government area of Katsina State. Worried that the continuous security challenges and related attacks by bandits on towns, villages, communities in Fuscari local government area have met on tall hardship on the people and have subjected the affected areas under serious survival threat. Senator Bello Mandia drawing the attention of the upper chamber to the kidnapping of 38 members of his constituency on Sunday, January 31st, 2022, by gunmen. He wants the federal government to intervene urgently as the insecurity in his state and some parts of the country have reached alarming levels. It's a sentiment shared by his colleagues. All the security agencies to come all on hide out of the kidnappers in a bid to rescue the 38 persons abducted by the government in Rongodia. We have to really look at it critically. I suggest that, yes, to me, I am saying that, yes, the security agent, of course, maybe we assume that they are doing their best, but to me, I think uh, that they need to do another best. We won't see a difference because we have made a difference in terms of funding. I know funding alone will not be enough. But funding can make a difference, and we expect 
a difference in outcome. Accordingly, the Senate urged the security agencies to rescue the 38 persons abducted by gunmen in Ruangodia in Castina State. It also called on the federal government to send enough military personnel and fighter jets to apprehend the bandits and restore normalcy in the affected areas. Meanwhile, the Senate examines a report by its Committee on National Security on the NSAS protest, which was hijacked by hoodlums in Calabar on October 23rd and 24th, 2020. Presenting the findings from its investigations, the committee chairman says public and private properties were vandalized by the hoodlums and the police and other security agencies were overwhelmed by the sheer number of the attackers. The committee makes several recommendations. That the federal government should evolve and implement holistic reforms in the Nigeria police that aimed at employing more more able-bodied personnel to providing adequate vehicles to the various commands three injecting more financial resources provision of adequate and the relevant arms ammunition and the other policing gadgets on the matter of compensation to some serving and past lawmakers and politicians whose properties were destroyed the senate notes that the matter be forwarded to the state ensas panel Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. While the protracted insurgency in the Northeast has prompted the president to give a marching order to the Committee on the Repatriation, Return and Resettlement of Displaced Persons in the area to ensure Nigerians witness a change in this regard, President Mohamed Buhari says this is in line with a promise he made in 2015 to restore peace to the region and return it to a path of development and growth. The Northeast crisis has always been on the front burner here at the presidential villa. There's been several security meetings and strategies all aimed towards fulfilling the president's promise to halt the 13-year-old conflict in the Northeast region. Well, today, insecurity is central again at this meeting as the president adopts yet another approach. Chairing the week's Federal Executive Council meeting, President Buhari re-pledged that commitment in his last 17 months in office as he inaugurates a presidential committee mandated to resolve the security crisis in the next few months. History beckons and Nigerians call on you to be the team that will finally chart this new path to restoration of sustainable peace and progress in the Northeast. And I strongly believe this could lead to the bringing of a template for addressing insurgency and instability in other parts of our country and across the world. Failure to deliver on this task you have been assigned is not an option. I pledge you that in the coming months, you will begin to witness a shift away from a protracted insurgency to peace building, stabilization, and ultimately development in your respective communities as we embark on a revised approach to addressing this conflict, a return to normalcy. The committee is mandated to, among other things, develop a concise three-year action plan by the end of March 2022 that incorporates national and state-level plans, providing a clear pathway for the restoration of peace and development in the Northeast. The new mandate undoubtedly boosts confidence, particularly in Borno State, which is at the epicenter of the crisis, as the governor hopes the committee will further deliberate on the management of repentant Boko Haram members. There is no any process that is perfect in the entire world, but so far so good. The process has yielded positive results. I believe uh, over 90 percent of those that have surrendered are doing well and have given the government the necessary support. They are also calling their colleagues in the bush to come out and join the process of peace building. President Buhari directed the committee to submit a monthly progress report, whilst the first progress review meeting will be held in the first week of March 2022. From the presidential villa, 
Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. And still ahead on News Round, President of Guinea Bissau narrowly escapes court tent. We'll get details uh, after the break. Just stay with us. Still watching News Round live on Channels Television. Now to health matters, as part of measures towards sustaining HIV response as well as address killer diseases and public health emergencies, the president has launched a 62.1 billion naira fund to improve efforts in this regard. President Mahmoud Buhari promised to continue to prioritize health interventions and hopes that the private sector-led initiative will surpass the target in the next five years. The president's call for renewed global action to end the HIV-AIDS pandemic has undoubtedly generated renewed responses across the board. Luminaries of Nigeria's private sector, including Africa's richest businessman, Alhaji Aliku Dangote, among others, converge on the State House for the launch of a 62.1 billion naira trust fund to expand domestic investments in HIV epidemic control. We have continued to make good our commitment of placing more people living with HIV on treatment annually using national resources. However, strong domestic resources mobilization with an enduring partnership and shared responsibility is required to sustain the response to HIV and other emerging public health emergencies. I hope the HIV Trust Fund of Nigeria will galvanize more of the private sector and others partners to surpass the target of 62 billion naira in the next five years. Currently, a total of 1.7 million Nigerians are living with HIV, while 1.6 million of that figure are in treatment. Our national coverage of prevention of mother-to-child transmission is less than 50%, leading to about 22,000 cases of new mother-to-child transmission of HIV every year in the country, securing a financing mechanism to guarantee a generation of HIV free babies is the basis of today's launch. The NACA DG concludes that Nigeria is on a fast track lane to control HIV by 2023, albeit international partners currently contributing about 80% of HIV funds agree that there is an urgent need to scale up domestic funding as Nigeria leads with the highest number of HIV infection among children. The United States remains committed to supporting Nigeria in reaching and sustaining HIV epidemic control, but we also believe that national ownership is critical to its success. The next phase of our game plan is to sustain these gains by ensuring that funding gaps are filled to keep people living with HIV on treatment. The United Nations had earlier asserted that the COVID-19 may push back progress on HIV by a decade, but also shares the optimism that crystallizing a domestic financing mechanism can halt the mother-to-child transmission of the virus by 2030. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television. Uh, and the former head of interim national government, Chief Ernest Shonekon, has been buried at a private cemetery in Lagos. A funeral service was held at the Cathedral Church, the Crown of Christ in Marina, with top dignitaries, including the nation's number two citizen, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, in attendance. The vice president paid glowing tributes to Chief Shonekon for his contributions to the country's unity. The journey to the church is without much ado. The roads are free of traffic, unusual for this time of the day, at Marina, Lagos. The state government ordered the traffic diversion for easy passage to the Cathedral Church of Christ for the state funeral service of Chief Ernest Jonico. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. The words of Job in the good book ring so true on the transition of former head of the interim national government. Inside the holy receptacle, 
the stained glass windows overlooks the sitting of Chief Enes Shonikon's family, his wife, Margaret Shonikon, and the children. Also present are Vice President Yemi Oshibajo, former President Goodluck Jonathan, former Head of State General Yakubu Gawan, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, Elder Statesmen, Governors, Top Military Brass, and other distinguished personalities from the public and private sector, as well as other invited guests. For I am sure that neither death nor life the reception of the body follows no with a full military compliment no for his status. Nor things to come, nor past, nor I, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Once seated, a member of the family takes one of the readings. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. Hymns. And prayers follow. And so whether we live, we are yours. And even in death, we are with you. Archbishop Peter Akiola delivers the sermon, bordering on choices one makes for the afterlife. People of God, set your heart. Are you with God? Is God with you? If you are not with God, take it from me, you are spiritually dead. Even though you have the semblance of being alive. The Vice President, Professor Yemio Shibajo, honors the memory of Chief Ernest Shonekon. Chief Shonekon lived his life always conscious and motivated by a burden of duty. As a citizen of considerable privilege to give back, either in his many philanthropic and civic pursuits or in public service, it is a testament to that sense of duty that even while out of office, Chief Shonekon remained deeply vested in the fate of his country. More hymns and prayers accompany the close of the service for the next port of call for Chief Shonekon, his final place of rest. For many here and elsewhere, Chief Shonikon may have passed on, but the lessons from his life of service to the nation will linger on in the memories of many. Olumide Macaulay, Channels Television News. All right, let's uh, now return to the National Assembly, where lawmakers are hoping to harmonize all the alterations to the 1999 Constitution and transmit same to the State House of Assembly by the end of this month for their votes. The Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, who is also the co-chair of the National Assembly Committee on the Review of the 1999 Constitution, says there are over 55 bills and memos from public hearings that the legislators need to consider before transmitting same to the states. The Deputy Senate President, Senator Ovia Omar Gege, arrives the venue where other members of the National Assembly Joint Committee on the review of the 1999 Constitution are holding a retreat. The federal lawmakers are having this two-day retreat to deliberate on bills and memos from previous public hearings proposing amendments to the 1999 Constitution. The Executive Director, Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, highlights some of the recommendations that are before the lawmakers. A lot of it has already been identified, including uh, provisions for special seats uh, for women. I know there's a lot of uh, 
misunderstanding yet about these provisions, but I think it's a key. Of course, other issues as well that are in consideration, uh, local governments and, and reforms regarding the judiciary. Uh, but I want to say that um, uh, this is a very important consultation, and I'd like to congratulate the National Assembly for the work done so far. There are at least 55 bills proposing amendments to the 1999 Constitution to be considered by these lawmakers. Both the chairman and the co-chair of the Joint Constitution Amendment Committee appeal to their colleagues to allow national interest to guide their contributions with a view to transmitting the harmonized alterations to the assemblies. Our consultants have analyzed submissions from public hearings and memos submitted by public harmonized and recommended over 55 bills across the various advertised thematic areas of the amendment exercise. Let our debate, opinions and decisions on the, amend on the amendment and, and expressive clauses be guided by what is best for our people and what is in the national interest. We are at the last tranche. We should do everything possible like we give the commitment to allow the bill go to state assembly before the end of this February. This effort will no doubt be very significant if it goes successful in the end. As there has been public demand for an alteration to the 1999 constitution, and if the lawmakers are able to carry out these amendments, it will go down in history as an accomplishment for the Ninth Assembly. A news round ends with the attempted coup in Guinea-Bissau, where the president of the country, Mario Mbale, says he survived the coup after being under heavy gunfire for five hours. He explained that the attackers tried to kill him and his entire cabinet at the government palace. President Mbale also says many others had been killed in a fighting on both sides, but he did not know the exact numbers, and the attackers were linked to drug trafficking in the country. And that's it on News Round for the week. Thank you for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye for now.